know, but it is interesting. How many moody people act moody while dating? They don't. Now, why can they control it while dating, but not afterwards? Okay, it's a rhetorical question. It's, it's clear that something is awry here. So that's one reason that the non-moody marry the moody. One reason is that they didn't know it. Another is the happy think they can change the unhappy. And uh, they learn <laughs> unbelievably painfully, wrong, you can't. There is only one person in the world who can make you happy. You. That's it. Others may make you miserable, but only you, no, that's true, unfortunately, but only you can make you happy. So I return to my primary statement. It is a moral attribute. Every single person rather be among happy people. You rather work with happy workers. You rather have happy parents. Ask anyone raised by an unhappy parent. And you will see why I say, and this has been my great insight on this matter for decades, it is a moral obligation to act happy. And that is why the title of this talk is Happiness is a Mitzvah. What does Mitzvah mean? Mitzvah is an obligation. It means commandment. We use it as meaning good deed, and presumably they, all mitzvahs are good deeds. But the most important aspect of the word ritzvah is that it's a commandment. It is a commandment to act happy. It's not a nice idea, it's a commandment. Because of the amount of good you will bring to the world. This is true on the micro and in the macro. It is true for your family life. If you, what is it? I have, I have. You can see at airports, you know, they sell it, some, many airports sell these little signs to put up in the house. Uh, like, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness. So here's one that you will see if they ever sell any signs about life, this is one of them. Happy wife, happy life. Why do they have such a sign? Because by and large it's true. Now notice incidentally, just for interest's sake, Nothing rhymes with husband. <laughs> happy husband, happy you. There's nothing to put in. Happy husband, so what? <laughs> I guess that's what it means. Actually, if you're married to a happy husband, let's put it this way, if you're married to an unhappy husband, you're not happy. It's not good. I would say, happy, so this is what I would say, happy wife, happy life, unhappy husband, unhappy wife. So that would be fair to say. We owe it to everybody. It is a moral obligation, and I don't understand why this is a truth, why this is a revelation to so many people. But it is. I guess because we have made everything into feelings and emotions. But happiness is well beyond feeling and emotion. It's an activity. One of the great thinkers of American history was Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln had a very awful life. He lost his beloved son, who he loved beyond words. His wife was, was either manic depressive or bipolar or, or some combination of whatever depressed states we would currently use the term for. And his country was killing each other. Other than that, things are great for Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln has the great, great virtue of having said, we are as happy as we decide to be. That's true. The unhappy think that those of us who act happy have an easy life. This is one of the great, great self-deceptions of the movie. They think that the people who walk around with a cheerful disposition had it easy, and that's the reason they have a cheerful disposition. But it's not true. Uh, on Earth, the percentage of people who had it easy is perhaps 2%. Perhaps. 98% haven't had it easy, and there is no way to know if a person has had an easy life by their cheerfulness. 
There are people who have lost a child who walk around with a happier disposition with all that permanent pain of the loss of a child and are picking the worst of the losses you can have. Then there are people who have had no comparable trauma and walk around miserable. So that's on the micro level what a moral obligation happiness is. Now on the macro, every Friday the second hour of my program is called the Happiness Hour. It's, I've been broadcasting it now for 17 years. Thank you. Only 11 people will quote it, but never no, 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 I wasn't asking for more. I was just pointing out a statistical fact. And, thank you, thank you. In any event, uh, it, it has been a, a very powerful thing for people, and for me, incidentally. I worked out a lot of my own issues through the happiness hour, believe it or not. There would be no way for you to know that, but I am telling you that I have. It's been a great help to me. Anyway, I point out almost every week as the show opens, the happy make the world better, the unhappy make it worse. I gave you the example in the micro, family life, friendship, workers. But on the macro, it's true. When you think of ISIS, do you think of the happiest Muslims joining ISIS? Do you, when you think of Islamists, is the first word that comes to your mind, happy-go-lucky? <laughs> hey, another great day to the head people. What a wonderful life. That's right? When you think about it. These people are miserable. They radiate miserableness. Happy people don't become uh, terrorists. Happy people don't become Nazis. Happy people didn't join the Communist Party. I mean, just think of that. Happiness is huge. This is what I'm trying to tell you. It's huge. Now, since I'm speaking at a shul, and since it's titled, Happiness is a Mitzvah, let me tell you something, and by the way, I have said this on the radio, even though 95% of my listeners are not Jewish. I have said this on the radio. When people say, where'd you get these ideas? And I will often say, from my religion, Judaism. And that is the case here. And I want you to understand how. How did I come up with these important insights from Judaism? So here, I'm going to now broaden this into um, another, if utterly related issue, but not just happiness. You all know, I presume, the famous story of the non-Jew, the pagan, who came to two great rabbis, Hillel and Shammai, and said, would you tell me what your religion is, Judaism is, while standing on one leg, on one foot, and how you translate it. So Shammai notoriously just hit the guy with a stick and told him to leave. He couldn't do something so, something so profound in, in, while standing on one leg. On the other hand, Hillel said, okay, no problem. Do unto others as you would want them to do. not do unto others as you would not want them to do to yourself. The rest is commentary, now go and study. That was it. And Hillel is considered the man who gave the proper answer, not Shammai. So, if I may, and I admit this takes a little chutzpah, because I know I'm not Hillel. Well. Nevertheless, uh, non-Jews come over to me, literally, <laughs> all the time, and ask me to summarize Judaism. They don't say, well, standing on one leg, but what is Judaism? So if I were to answer this pagan coming to my home with that question, I would have an even briefer answer than Hillel. And this would be my answer. Behavior is everything. That would be it. Not feelings. If there is a message we Jews need to bring to the world, and this has been my great lament, we are messengers who forgot our message, which is God-based ethics. That is the whole point of Judaism, to bring the world back to Mount Sinai. That's another talk. You can certainly ask about it during the question and answer period. But our message is, in addition to God, our message is behavior, not feelings. 
לא המחשבה העיקר אלא המעשה. It's not the thought that counts but the deed. We live in an age where the thought counts and not the deed. Now I'm good, I, I uh, debated coming here whether I would allow myself even an inty teensy bit of what you might call political thought, but having you pretty much know <laughs> my politics, and I'm not here to speak specifically about politics, but I want you to understand how I see much of the political divide, one side being much more action-oriented and the other motive-oriented. I'll give you one example. Affirmative action for black Americans, lowering academic standards to bring in more blacks and Hispanics, but especially blacks. If you are motive-oriented, you are for affirmative action. If you are behavior-oriented, you're against it. Because it doesn't work. And in fact, by every piece of data I've ever seen, including from black academics, it has been horrible, horrible for many black students. Because they get into colleges that they're not academically prepared for, and then they graduate at a much lower rate than other students. That's not their fault. I went to Ivy League graduate school, but I was not ready for Ivy League undergraduate school. I was not academically ready. I know, I knew it then. My father wanted me to go to Columbia University, and I wanted to go to Brooklyn College. Thank God, Columbia rejected me. <laughs> I say thank God, because I might have flunked down. I wasn't prepared. Instead, I did very well at Brooklyn and ended up at Columbia for graduate school. It worked out perfectly. But I wasn't ready. It's not a knock on, on blacks or whites or anybody if you're not academically ready for a rigorous college. But you should be accepted based on your preparedness. But if you, if you design policies based on what makes you feel good, you're for affirmative action. Because after all, this country had did so much injustice to blacks, so you feel you owe it to them. They are owed more spaces in prestigious colleges, and so on. Feelings versus behavior is huge. It, it, it's the way parents now bring up children. It's feelings oriented, not behavior oriented. My older son, who's now a father of two himself, my older son, right, right in a park very near here, because he was then, I was living in Pico Robertson, and he was a baby there. And uh, one day he was at the, a park near here, and he was about two years old, so a toddler. And some five, six, seven year old, I don't know because his mom was there, not I, she told me the story later, just came over and threw my son onto the floor. Just like that. The mother ran over to her son and said, Darling, what's troubling you? Okay. That woman is the product of a society that says feelings matter and not behavior. What troubles people who do evil doesn't trouble me. What troubles me is the evil that they do. This notion, if we can only figure out the psychological state of people who do bad, will conquer evil, is wrong. It's just wrong. The issue is you must control behavior, period. In eighth grade at Yeshiva in, in Brooklyn, uh, the uh, Rebbe got a little tired of me uh, talking in class and to put down his cigarette. <laughs> he smoked in class. I was, those were the good old days. It was a freer, freer time. Uh, but when I put his, he did, he smoked in class, put his cigarette down, took me and threw me over two desks. Okay. Now, by the way, I remember this vividly. One thing I remember was, I am so much bigger than him. How did he do this? <laughs> and he was a very small uh, guy, and I was always big. So I, he 
kicked me out of class afterwards. I wrote him an apology note, I'll never forget, on toilet paper. I went to the bathroom, I wrote an apology. I was very sincere, because I, I wasn't a bad kid. I was just, I, I was bored out of my mind. I talked the whole time. So the only reason I'm telling you this is to, is to bring this to your attention. Whenever I tell this story on the air or in a speech to people today, their first reaction is, wow, what did your father say? when he heard what the rabbi did. To which my answer is, you have to be kidding. Had I told my father, he'd have thrown me over two desks. <laughs> You've got to be kidding. That's the last thing I'm going to tell my father. Then I'm finished at home, just like I was finished at school. It's a different time today. To say that any teacher who would do that today would be fired and sued and, and very possibly imprisoned. Okay? In, in our time, though, the teacher was right and the student was wrong, period. Now, are there times where that was just wrong? I, you know, it, it, by the way, this transcends religion. I'll, many of you may remember my beginning in radio was here in LA on a national show, but I began here in LA. And it was with a very popular program, Religion on the Line. I had a rabbi, priest, and minister, different ones every week, two hours Sunday night. It was extremely popular, and I loved doing it. I did it exactly for 10 years. And after about five years, I realized, I actually said this once, or four, more than once on the air. I said, hi everybody, welcome to Religion on the Line, or the ex-Catholic Hour. We got so many calls from ex-Catholics who were still angry at a nun from third grade because she wrapped him with a ruler on his knuckles. I remember a guy, he was 90, he said, you know, I want to tell you I left the church when I was a kid. So I said, why? I said, because the nun wrapped me with a ruler, I'll never go back to church. So I said, I'm just curious how old he was, 90. Bugging you for 87 years or whatever for, for 80 years? It's like unbelievable. I'm not bugged that my rabbi did that. He was right, to be perfectly honest. I was a nuisance. We live in the age of feelings. Everything is about feelings. How is good and evil determined? How do you feel about it? There is no good and evil. It's feelings. Do you know that I speak to Jewish kids and they're not prepared to say the Nazis were wrong? You, I know you don't believe me. It's okay. What I am, I am preparing to make a film on what young Americans think that you will see. So this is what happens. I go and I speak to students, high school students, let's say, and I will say, so is there a right and a wrong? Or are there only opinions about a right and a wrong? answer only opinions. There's no objective of good and evil. There are only opinions about what is good or evil. So then I would say to Jewish kids when I speak at a Jewish school, so I'm just curious, so are you prepared to say what the Nazis did to the Jews was wrong or only in your opinion they were wrong, but after all they thought they were right? And they almost all say, it's only my opinion. Of course, in my opinion, what they did. You should not misunderstand my anecdote here. It is not that there are any Jewish kids who thought the Nazis were right. It's that they're not prepared to say they were wrong, only that it's a matter of opinion. My opinion against Nazi opinion. Everything is feelings. And I learned from Judaism that there is a moral right and wrong that is objective because it's rooted in God, not personal opinion. That was huge. It is huge. And, and we all, we who believe that, are a very small minority of Americans today. Especially if you go to college and especially if you go to graduate school. It's all opinion. And it's all feelings. That's why the universities today are all about you can't hurt anybody's feelings. 70% of American young people, that is college students, believe that racist and sexist talk should be prohibited on campus. Banned. Banned. Not to have 
somebody speaks because somebody's feelings may be hurt. The whole point, of course, of free speech is that, of course, it might hurt people's feelings. Nazis marched in Skokie, Illinois, which had a disproportionate number of Holocaust survivors living there. And the ACLU defended their right to march there. Because in America, it's freedom of speech. Not anymore. Free speech is not a value among most, most young Americans. If it hurts people's feelings, it should be banned. And it's all a matter of feelings. They had a debate at a university, at Brown University, they had a debate. Two women debated on whether or not the campus is a rape culture. This is a new charge made against American colleges that they are a rape culture. One woman said it's not a rape culture, one woman said it was. Brown University provided a safe room for students who would be traumatized by hearing somebody say it was not a rape culture. That they would be so offended by that opinion, and you know what they provided them? They provided them with Play-Doh and with stuffed animals. These are college students. Instead of saying, what the hell is wrong with you? If you can't hear an opinion you don't agree with, you, you are an infant. Grow up. But if anybody in college said that, they'd be fired. Because the, the students are now customers, not students. And you don't, you, the customer is always right. How do you get $50,000 a year? You have to make the customer happy. Feelings, everything's feelings uber alles. Feelings above everything. And I learned, I learned in, in Judaism that it's actions, not feelings. This was huge. The, the Tanakh, the, our Bible, is filled with warnings not to trust the heart. I mean, if you daven regularly, you say, Don't follow your eyes or your heart. And it's always mistranslated. It's translated, after which you go astray. It's not what the Hebrew says. After which you prostitute yourself. If you follow your heart, you'll be a prostitute. That's the Torah, man. That's what I grew up with, because I know the Hebrew. The Tanakh doesn't trust the heart as far as it can throw it. This is how you behave. Act happy, you'll feel happy. And if you don't feel happy, okay, doesn't matter. You still owe it to your fellow human being to act happy. Where I work at, uh, at my radio station, my home radio station here in Los Angeles, in Glendale, and it's, it's a very happy part of the, the whole floor, which is offices of the radio stations. There are a number that my syndicator owns. And everybody seems to come by because they know they'll, they'll laugh. No matter when they come by, they'll be in good mood. And I take credit for that. I'm not here to boast, but I'm here to, I know what to take credit for because I'm the head of my show. So if I am happy, and I treat everybody with a happy disposition, it filters down. And if I were moody, and I yelled at underlings, then they would. Everybody knows it, and everybody appreciates it. By the way, act, no matter what it is, actions count more. Now, I will now be very, very popular with many of the men here. And, uh, I don't know how the women will react, but nevertheless, on the basis of my Jewish and human insight that you can't be guided by your feelings or your mood, I wrote an article, which is all over the internet, about five, eight years ago, a, when it's titled, When a Woman is Not in the Mood. Maybe, since mood shouldn't direct other things in life, maybe it shouldn't even always, and I admit sometimes it must, but maybe it shouldn't always direct when you make love to your husband. 
I am one of the most popular men among husbands in the United States. Couples come over to me, it's actually quite adorable. My wife is here and she, she's a witness to this, that uh, couples will come over to me and say, with this big glimmer in their eye, I just want you to know your, uh, your male female hour has changed our lives. And I know exactly what they're talking about. And the husband looks at me and I look at him and I go, sir, you owe me big. And he goes, I certainly do. And she's happier too. And you know how I learned not to let your mood direct you? So I tell this story to non-Jews. Jews, though, especially knowledgeable Jews, even appreciate it more. One of the life-changing moments of my life was in fourth grade at Yeshiva. Oh, you see, I always translate this because I speak mostly to non-Jews, but I don't have to translate this for you. The guy gets up, the rabbi gets up, he goes, okay, boys, Time for Mincha. Time to Daven Mincha. Well, there may be not some non-Jews here. Time for the afternoon prayers. I walked over to the rabbi. And there was no chutzpah intended, or certainly no disrespect. It's clearly a little chutzpah, but it was no disrespect intended. And I said, Rabbi, I'm sorry, but I'm not in the mood. <laughs> To Daven Mincha. <coughs> this guy, this rabbi, was from Eastern Europe, <laughs> survivor of the Holocaust. And he spoke English, but in his whole life he had never heard the word mood <laughs> and Daven in the same sentence. This was a new moment for him, it was, it was a revelatory moment. So he didn't know what to do, it was clear. He, he thinks, he strokes his beard, it was classic Jewish stuff. And then he goes, oh, <laughs> Shmuel Prager. That's my Hebrew name, of course. Shmuel Prager is not in the mood to dub in Mincha. So what? <laughs> it was a life-changing moment. You mean my mood didn't matter? Me, the center of the universe in fourth grade? My mood was not determinative? The man changed my life. So what is one of the great answers parents should give their kids almost all the time? I'm not in the mood to read. I'm not in the mood to, to, uh, to turn the TV off. I'm not in the mood to go to bed. I'm not, I'm not in the mood to anything. <laughs> I'm not in the mood to eat vegetables. Of course not. If you live by what you're in the mood to do, you'll ruin your life. So it, that's how I learned, and I applied that even to the marital bed. That I'm not saying every time, but mood can't always be the determinant, deter, determinant. And a wise woman knows this. Mood. This is a huge, huge thing. This is Judaism's great gift. This is a great gift to the world. It's behavior. Honor your father and mother. There's no mitzvah to love your father and mother. You have to love your neighbor, you have to love the stranger, you have to love God, you don't have to love your parents. You have to honor them. A lot of people don't love their parents or have mixed feelings. It doesn't matter. If your father and mother, you honor them. They have a unique role in the world. People who don't like the president still stand up for the president when he comes into a room. They're not honoring the president, they're honoring the presidency. That, that's the way it works in life. In the mood, can you imagine if you did that in anything else in life? Oh, in the mood to go to work today. All right, you're fired. <laughs> We're not in the mood to have you uh, work for us. <laughs> that's your mood versus our mood. Our mood wins. I mean, think about it. What, what, what can be determined? You know what? M mood for trivial stuff. I'm in the mood for Chinese and, and uh, food tonight. Okay, I'm Chinese food tonight. That's fine. For trivia, mood is fine. So this is critical. Behavior, behavior. Act happy, you will feel happy. Act religious. Maybe then you will actually feel religious. People, the non I, I direct so much of my life to, to non-religious people. 
And, and basically people are waiting to have, as Christians would put it, their road to Damascus, where all of a sudden they, they perceive the divine. It doesn't happen. You're not going to find God one day, you're a secular human being, one day you're walking on Wilshire Boulevard, God appears to you. It doesn't happen. If you act religious, you'll start feeling it. As I tell Jews, and, and, I'm, and I'm, as many of you know, and I, I never like to be perceived as what I'm not, I am deeply a religious Jew, but I'm not orthodox. I do, I do some sins. And uh, anyway, nevertheless, I have brought more Jews to orthodoxy, ironically, than almost anybody. I mean, this is a, a fact I'm proud of. It's just, but it is a fact. And one of the things I tell Jews all the time, I'll tell you what, here's the deal. This coming year, Friday night, make Shabbat in your home. Don't go to the movies, don't go out, don't watch TV, don't watch movies, just for family and or friends, have a Shabbat meal. After 52 times, if you still feel nothing, go back to movies on Friday night. But, it, but anybody who's ever tried it doesn't want to go back to movies. Because they behaved a certain way 52 times or 50 times or 45 times, that has been meaningful. Act loving, you'll feel loving. Every time you say I love you to your spouse, it doesn't mean that you are in the throes of romantic feeling necessarily. You say it because it has its own impact. It creates in you and in them more of a loving atmosphere. So it's worth saying. And if you don't, can't say it, you have a bad marriage, it's a separate issue. But if you have a decent marriage to a decent human being, it should be said. Act in any way and then you will feel it. By the way, act selfish, you'll end up selfish. Ray Fine, the actor, was the Nazi commandant in Schindler's List. I'll never forget an interview with him in the New York Times at the time of the movie. And he said a fascinating thing. He said, I couldn't wait till the movie was over. And so the interviewer said, why? He said, because I was getting meaner when I wasn't in front of the camera. Oof, I get the chills telling you the story. And by the way, the opposite is true. I, even though I live here and I'm somewhat well-known, I've never pursued celebrities. I have no interest in celebrities. I have interest just in interesting and good people. There was one exception, Charlton Heston. When he invited me to lunch, I grabbed it. And we became somewhat friendly. And I asked him once, did playing Moses, the most famous role he had in the Ten Commandments, did playing Moses affect your life? Not affect your acting, affect your life. And it, it, he said it was life changing. A, because of the role I played affected the way I want to live my life. And B, because I knew people perceived me as Moses, I had to be a decent person. Isn't that interesting? And here's Ray Fine as a Nazi commandant, just acting. He knows he's acting and it's still having an impact. That's how powerful behavior is. Feelings. You know, I have, uh, I have become a, a great advocate of Christian-Jewish unity and bonding in America because we've been blessed to live in this country. America's Christians are not Europe's Christians. And Jews should never saddle America's Christians with the terrible things done by European Christians. And I speak always of Judeo-Christian values because they exist. Judeo-Christian theology is not an issue. It doesn't, there are different theologies. But values? Having said that, that is all a, uh, a preface to one of the handful of differences, not theologically, but values-wise between Judaism and Christianity. And I, and I say this to, to Christian audiences. It's, it's not... Uh, I never tell, somebody told me his father once told him something to the effect, never tell a lie, 
you, you, then you don't have to remember what you said. And I, I somehow instinctively adopted that at a very early age. I don't tell audiences different things because I'll never remember what, what I told which audience. So I say the same thing to all audiences. But here's an interesting difference. And it is a feeling behavior difference. Christianity is more feeling and Judaism is more behavior. By the way, they, it's not a one-way street though because sometimes Jews have gone kaga on behavior where halacha becomes God and, and you know, uh, what is it? One of the great uh, uh, rabbinim said uh, sometimes uh, Sometimes halacha can be a bodhisattva. Sometimes Jewish law can be idol worship. It's very important to remember. So we can overdo it on the behavior, and they can overdo it on the faith. But having said that, here's a difference. Jesus says, whoever looks at a woman with lust has committed adultery uh, with his heart. It's a very famous phrase in Matthew. So I want to tell you uh, one of the greatest stories of my life. One night, on religion on the line. Uh, again, there's a different priest, different rabbi, different minister, Protestant minister, each week. I would come in about 10 minutes before the show, tell them the subject, and then open up the show with having each of them comment for a minute or two on the subject. So I come in and I say, uh, gentlemen, Honored to meet you and see you tonight. Subject tonight is you and your religion's understanding of lust. Okay. So I always went Protestant, Catholic, Jew, because I went by population statistics. And then I, on the second round, I went Jew, Catholic, Protestant. First round, I go, uh, gentlemen, please. Uh, succinctly put your view and that of your religion about lust. So we begin with the Protestant minister, of course he quotes Jesus, whoever lusts after another woman has committed adultery with his heart and speaks beautifully of the importance of purity of thought and is beautifully eloquently said. The Catholic priest essentially said the same thing, quoting Jesus and the purity of thought and the importance of it. Now came the rabbi's turn, and the rabbi, most of the time the rabbis were not orthodox rabbis because they were more reform and conservative and reconstructionist. But not only was this rabbi tonight orthodox, he was bearded East European. And I had never met him in my life, and I had no idea what he would say. No. So, Rabbi, please, your view and that of Judaism of lust. He strokes his beard, which you couldn't have seen, it was radio, but he goes like this. Dennis, lust, schmust. <laughs> that was his whole answer. <laughs> I have never wanted to kiss a bearded rabbi. <laughs> As much as I did at that moment, I thought the man was the Mashiach. I, 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 I tell you, it was like one of the unbelievable moments of my life. The last thing I expected. Why did he say lust must? Because in Judaism, we wouldn't say if you, if you lust for another woman, you've committed adultery with your heart. Because in Judaism, you can't commit adultery with your heart. You can only commit adultery with another organ. And, and that's not involved in this particular case. It's a classic example of okay, okay. I was raised in a home, I was raised in a very, very uh, close to unique home. Not every home is unique in its own way, but uh, this will certainly give you an example. My parents were Orthodox Jews. Never drove on Shabbos, did, never turned on a light. If they ever opened mail on Shabbos, it was via a hot sponge to soak the envelope open. That's how I grew up. Okay, so I want you to understand this. But my father was a unique character, truly unique. He was American born, as was my mother, which for my generation immediately is somewhat different. 
And they were not only very Jewish and very Orthodox, but they were also quite American, especially my father, who joined the Navy because he said, I don't want to leave the guy in fighting Hitler. Jews should fight Hitler too, to his great credit. There's another reason he joined, because my, my brother couldn't stop crying. But uh, that's a separate issue. He just felt that fighting World War II was easier than dealing with my brother, who was a, a very crying baby. I wasn't born yet. But in any event, the, more, the, the bigger reason is the first reason. My father joins the uh, Navy, becomes, ultimately comes a, uh, a very high officer in the Navy for three years in the Pacific. And so this is all a preamble to a very real difference. My father became the president of the Orthodox school that we attended, Kingsway Jewish Center, Nostrand Avenue on Kings Highway, Brooklyn, New York. So I don't know why anybody would applaud, but nevertheless, it's a wonderful place. Anyway, my father became president, and my father, I, I, I hope that the rabbi will not regret my having been invited, but my father subscribed. He didn't merely pick up at the newsstand and hide it in a brown bag. He subscribed to Playboy magazine. The president of an Orthodox, more than that, he left a copy on the night table or on the, on the coffee table and then put it away where both his sons would have access to it in his study downstairs. So you would have the Talmud and then every issue of Playboy that was ever put out. Now, as if he made a very big impact on it. It's the reason I can talk so freely about sexual issues is thanks to my father because my father was married to my mother for 69 years. They had a love affair for 69 years. They really 73, they dated for four. 73 years. When she died, she preceded him, he was 90. It was the end of his world. She was the center of his universe. She knew he got Playboy. So I, I didn't grow up with the notion that who, whoever lusts after another woman has committed adultery with his heart or anything else. He was totally loyal to my mother. Till my mother died, he, all he would say to me is, your mother is the most beautiful woman in the world. I, I, I tell you, I'm almost, I'm almost going to well up with tears because he meant it. And by the way, she was beautiful till 90. Every day she did her hair, every day she wore a beautiful skirt. I mean, it was, she, she took her looks seriously till the day she left us. And my father told the world how lucky he was every day. It was an amazing, it, I grew up seeing a love affair. But uh, the man, Red Playboy, Red, <laughs> Red is sorry. He observed Playboy. This was a very huge lesson. Now, I know that in from life that would not be looked on positively. I understand that, and I'm not trying to advocate anything. I'm trying to explain that this is possible, and that is why a bearded East European rabbi, well to the right of my father, would have said lust schmust. These are all illustrations of this phenomenal teaching of Judaism, its behavior its behavior. The Torah doesn't say give tzedakah as you feel. It says give 10% whether or not your heart is in it. That's it. And for all the mitzvahs, it doesn't say if you feel like it or be guided by your heart. So I conclude by saying this is what I learned, this unbelievable lesson. It isn't intentions. It isn't feelings. It's behavior. And that's even true for the topic of the evening, happiness. Lincoln was right, you are as happy as you decide to be, or to be even more precise, you're as happy as how you decide to act. Thank you for hearing. Thank you very much.